America is trying to hinder, when life is trying to defeat us, we have seen that we have God on our side. We have seen that the Lord has given us sources of strength that we can draw from to be able to endure, to be able to persevere through life. Last week, we saw that the Lord, our God, has given us a source of strength by giving us his, pre his peace through his only begotten son. And through his only begotten son, we have a source of strength in that peace so that we can again be able to endure and be able to persevere through all that life throws at us when it is trying to knock us out. In my sermon today, we are going to see that again, we have another source of strength that the Lord has given to us, which Paul calls our bond of perfection. The bond of perfection, I tell you today, that it is another source of strength that you can draw from to be able to endure and to be able to persevere through life. Now, over my last five sermons, now six sermons, including this one, I have encouraged all of you to live for the better. We have seen that we should live for the better by realizing that we are the ones that are in control of our lives. And because we are in control of our lives, we are in control of the choices. We are in control of the decisions that we can make in our life. And we saw in my very first sermon in this series that the first choice that we should make in our lives, if we truly desire to live for the better is that we should choose God over everything. Right. If you want to live for the better, then you would choose God first. You would choose God over everything. Yet choosing to live by the instructions of God, it does not mean that we will have no difficulties in life. Didn't I tell y'all you would hear it again right. in the sermon today? Right. Things don't get any easier for us just because we have chosen God over everything. Life won't be filled with sunshine and rainbows just because we have chosen God over everything. The, the genuine believer, we are still going to have struggles. We're still going to have troubles. In other words, we're still going to have trials. We are still going to have tribulation. We're still going to have afflictions. We're going to have infirmities. We're going to have those that stand in opposition against us. Life is not going to get any easier for us just because we have chosen God over everything. So living for the better, it is actually incredibly difficult for us. But yeah, I tell you today that though it is difficult for us, it is not impossible for any of us to live for the better in this life that we live. Now with life being incredibly difficult, the Lord, I want you to understand today, did not leave us helpless, nor did the Lord leave us alone. God did not leave us to tackle this difficult life all by ourselves. No, God has given to us first his only begotten son, whose grace by faith we now live under today. Jesus said that he is our good shepherd, and as our good shepherd, I will tell all of you today who are of genuine faith, you should lean on him. You should be totally dependent on him as you are grazing in his fields. In other words, as we live in this world today, we should depend on our good shepherd. Jesus, he said that he knows us by our name. 
Jesus, he said that he cares for us. Jesus said that he will provide for us. As our good shepherd, Jesus said that he will give his life. He will protect us while we are in this world. So as we are the sheep of his pasture, again, I say to you today, we should all be totally dependent on him. God, he has not only given us his only begotten son, but the Lord, he has also given to us his Holy Spirit. God has given us the spirit that dwells in us. And in the giving of his Holy Spirit, which again dwells in all of us, there is a voice from the Holy Spirit today. Whose voice that we should be heeding every step that we go along the way in our life. The spirit is there to guide us along the way. Let's remember that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to guide us through our ups and through our downs. So as we saw last week, the Lord has given himself to help us in life. God has given himself to be a source of strength in this difficult life. When life is trying to beat you up, when life has you in the corner, trying to throw a haymaker, God has given himself. God has said that he is in your corner to encourage you, to give you the strength to be able to fight, to be able to endure, to be able to persevere, and to be able to make it. Yet again, I will tell you that God didn't stop there when it came to giving you sources of strength mm -hmm. to draw from mm -hmm. right. in this difficult life. Well. The Lord, I want to show you today as I reference a very familiar scripture, one of our favorites mm -hmm. in this congregation. We, we hear it all the time. I want to reference one of Christ's teaching in which Christ, he said that we should love the Lord who again has given himself. But we will remember that Christ said that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Didn't Christ say that? And see, I tell you today, there is so much power. There is so much strength in that teaching from Christ. But the sad part is, is that we often overlook that teaching. We often misunderstand the power that is there. And Jesus telling us to love the Lord and then for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. There is strength. There is power there that I feel you need to know, that I feel you need to recognize today. So let's dive into it. Let me explain the, the, the strength that is there in that statement from Christ today. Loving God and loving our neighbor, that is the foundation of our faith. Do you understand what that means when I say that that is the foundation of our faith? It is the source of strength that we should stand on. The foundation of a house is what keeps it standing. When the storms come upon that house, it still stands because it is built on a foundation. Loving the Lord, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, it is the foundation of our faith. When we do it, it upholds us. Yeah, yeah. Preach, Preach. So when life is trying to beat you up, on, loving the Lord is a source of strength. When life is trying to beat you up, the love of your neighbor is guess what? 
it's a strength. Did you know that? Have you ever paid that verse any attention in that light today? In our key verse for today, by the way, we are in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 14 and 15. Those two verses, they are my key verses for today. But they're in my key verse for today. I want you to see that Paul calls love, he calls it the bond of perfection. Look at the word that he used there. He said, love is the bond. That word is important. But then he said, perfection. Perfection is the freedom from fault, right? It's the freedom from defect. Perfection is flawlessness. Did you hear that? Love, Paul says there, is flawlessness. So the love that Paul was speaking of, it was, or it is, without stain. It was, or it is, without blemish. It is without defect. So as you often hear me say, when we start talking about the love that Paul is speaking about there, we ain't talking about love that is of worldly doctrine. Did you hear me? We, we ain't talking about no worldly love right now. Worldly love, that's what will be celebrated on Tuesday. Don't shake your head like that, D. You know I'm right about that. The, the love that, that Paul was speaking about there, the love that I'm looking at right now, it is based on the love that is of God. He ain't talking about no love that is of the world. When he's talking about the bond of perfection, as we are talking about today, we're talking about the love that is of God, our maker, our creator, the one that is sovereign, the one that sits high, the one that looks low. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To the Corinthians, we know that Paul said that the love of God, it ain't based on ego. It's not based on pride. But rather the love of God, it is selfless, mm -hmm. always focusing on others, looking outwardly, if you will. Mm -hmm. To the Colossians here today in the third chapter of Colossians, we'll see Paul speak to how one truly goes about loving their neighbor. Mm -hmm. So let's pay close attention here to this third mm -hmm. chapter. Let's pay close attention here to what Paul says here. In order for us to love, we will see Paul said there in the fifth verse. He said that we must put to death fornication. He said we must put to death uncleanness. We must put to death passion. He said we must put to death evil desire. We must put to death covetousness. Then there is the eighth verse. We'll see Paul stated that we must also put off anger. All right. We must put off wrath. Yeah. Listen to this one. He said we must put off malice. Don't overlook that word. He said we must put off blasphemies. Then Paul said we must put off filthy language. You know, a lot of times we look at that filthy language and we just think about cussing. But Paul wasn't just talking about no cussing and swear words and anything like that. We'll get into that in a moment. He said, lastly, there in the ninth verse, he said, in order for us to truly love, Paul, he called for us not to lie. He said, we shouldn't lie to another. Lying is filthy language. I, I would throw that out there for you. Like I said, I, I would get to filthy language in a moment. There that moment is. Because right. a lot of times we just think of cussing, but anything that can tear someone down, that's filthy language. It ain't doing no good. Mm -hmm. But he said lie. He said, don't lie to another. 
And the reason why he said that we ought not lie to another is because lying is the way of our old man. And guess what? You said that you were of genuine faith. <laughs> and so if you, were, if you are of genuine faith, guess what you should have did with that old man? Old man was supposed to have been thrown away a long time ago. Old man should have been put off of you a long time ago. Have you thrown that old man off of you yet? So when Jesus calls for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, we, we should understand, we should have a clear understanding here of how we should do so. See, when we remove things like anger, when we remove wrath, when we remove malice, when we remove evil desire, when we remove something like covetousness away from us, we can begin to love somebody. Did you hear that? When you stop lying to people, when you stop speaking to them to tear them down, when you stop using filthy language, you can begin to draw closer to someone. We can come closer together and we can form stronger bonds. See, coming together in this manner, Drawing closer together, forming that bond of perfection. We have a word for what that kind of love with one another is called. And that word is fellowship. We will live in fellowship with one another. Therefore, the bond of perfection that we are speaking of today and that we're looking at today is fellowship. Fellowship with each other. You see, fellowship with the Lord, we know that it is a very strong source of strength. But again, we often overlook, we often undervalue fellowship with each other. And we should stop doing that. All right. It's time for us to stop overlooking fellowship with one another. It's time for us to stop undervaluing fellowship with one another. Again, it, I will be remiss if I ignored the month that we are now in. Right. In our people, we've always had a, a close bond with each other because of the color of our skin, right. because of understanding what we go through. And I believe I say this every Black History Month, but I feel like I always remember what my dad and what my uncles, my aunts, my grandparents, and how they spoke of how we were in the past and the, the tight community that there was in the past. And my, my dad would often talk about if he messed up in school, by the time he would get home from school, his, his folks would already know. That's the kind of fellowship that they had. My uncle said, yeah, that's true. That's the kind of love that was out there because they just wanted to see the young ones succeed. And, and we ought to want to see each other succeed today. Fellowship with each other, I tell you today that it is a very powerful source of strength when it comes to wanting to live for the better, mm -hmm. when it comes to wanting to endure, when it comes to wanting to persevere through life itself. Again, I say to you, God did not leave us helpless, nor has he left us to tackle life by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have each other. Mm -hmm. This, I'm telling you, is coming from someone who would call himself an introvert. Mm -hmm. I love being by myself, <laughs> but at the same time, I know that I can't take on life by myself. Again, I went through five years of dialysis, and, and I tell you that I didn't make it through those years by myself. I didn't go through that great struggle. I didn't go through that tribulation on my own. I had nurses. I had doctors. I had my brother. Most importantly, I had my mom, who was there every step of the way. And I stand here today because of God, because of them, and because of all of you as well. We need him, the Lord, but at the same time, we need each other to make it through life. Yeah, yeah. We need each other today. In this first epistle, John, he spent a great deal of time focusing in on the bond of perfection. 
that is love and fellowship. He, in his first chapter, first John, the third and the fourth verse, John, he wrote, and he encouraged others to join in and be in fellowship with the Lord and all of those who are of genuine faith. Now, John, he did this again because he knew the power and the strength of being there for one another. He knew the power and strength of loving your neighbor. You see, by being in fellowship with the Lord and with each other, John, he stated there in that first chapter and in the third and the fourth verse that our joy will be full. In other words, we will be living for the better. We will be at peace. So again, if you truly desire to live for the better, if you desire to be happy, if you desire to be joyful, what should you do? You should love the Lord with your whole heart. And then guess what? At the same time, you should be loving your neighbor as you love yourself. The bun of perfection, I tell you today, it is one that uplifts. You hear me say that all the time about love. You never hear me say that love will tear you down. The bun of perfection, it will uplift you to higher heights. That is, the love of God will lift you to higher heights. The love of the world, it can't do such a thing. Scripture, it points out, it makes a very drastic difference between love that is worldly, that is of worldly doctrine, and love that is of the Lord. See, worldly love has caused many people to grow envious of others. Worldly love has caused many people to try to make others jealous. Worldly love, in other words, it causes people to be jealous of others. Worldly love, it likes to play games. Worldly love is like to make people to compete. Frankly, when you think about it, uh, when it comes to worldly love, worldly love is incredibly dangerous. Worldly love, it is very toxic if you will. See, I'm sure you have heard that old saying that says, love can make you do some crazy things. Some would tell you there ain't much wrong with being jealous or envying someone or being upset and angry and using filthy language if you're doing it in the name of love. They would say that, hey, ain't nothing wrong with acting out if you're doing it in the name of love. Now just for a moment, we're chuckling about it. We're laughing about it because we done heard it before. But think about how crazy that sounds. Stalking someone, beating them up in the name of love, wasting all of that energy, wrecking and ruining your peace in the name of love. Love will make you do some crazy things, they say. You know, people have gotten into fights. They have caused physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual damage in the name of love. See, worldly love, it moves on the principle of one's own self-interest, their own self-desires, moves on selfishness. Yeah, I tell you today, one cannot be so selfish and think that they are going to be happy and joyful at the end of the day. No, in, in that end, people are just torn apart rather than being together. There is no growth in that end when we are so damaged and when we are so torn apart because we're moving out of worldly love. Again, I want you to understand today that we are stronger together in the bond of perfection that we are apart. So the difference is that the love of God encourages us to be careful about how we speak to one another. The love of God, it calls for us and it encourages us to be careful for how we treat one another. Let us remember the golden rule, which says that we should treat others the way that we 
ourselves will want to be treated. If you want to be loved, then you ought to love somebody. The bond of perfection. Later here in his first epistle, Judd said in the third chapter and in the 11th and the 12th verse that we have heard from the beginning or what we have heard from the beginning is that we should love one another and not be like Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. Rather than loving his brother, Cain killed him. When the Lord desired for Cain to stop thinking just about himself. When the Lord desired for Cain to not only love himself, but to love those that were around him. Cain, he killed his brother because he was too self-centered. Think about that kind of love there. You see, this is made clear to us when he was asked by God where Abel was just after he had killed his brother. After he had killed his brother, Cain gave a response to the Lord that was apathetic and that was self-centered. Cain, he asked the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? He loved himself, didn't he? To the point that he said that. He was being smart about it, but I tell you, he was supposed to be his brother's keeper. Just as Abel was supposed to be his keeper, and I imagine that Abel was his keeper. Repeatedly throughout scripture, we are called to be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. And to let brotherly love continue. You and I, we should understand we are to be each other's keeper today. Not just focusing in on ourselves, but focusing on all of those that are around us and loving them with brotherly love. The proverb said, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You see, again, I tell you that we are to look out for each other. We are to always be ready to help each other in the name of love, the love that is of the bond of perfection, the love that is of the Lord our God. You see, when we are always ready to help one another, when we're always looking out for one another, when we're always each other's keeper, that is the true bond of perfection. That is True love. Paul called on us as the elect of God to put on tender mercies. He called for us there in the third chapter of Colossians, the 12th and the 13th verse. He called for us to put on kindness, to put on humility, to put on meekness, to put on low suffering, to bear with one another and to forgive. To forgive each other. Again, to reiterate, to reiterate the point here, we are to be each other's keeper in brotherly love. As John said, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Again, if we are in fellowship with one another, this is possible. You see, if we are in fellowship with one another, if we are loving each other, there are benefits that we must be made aware of today. So let me share some of those benefits that comes from the bond of perfection with you. To start off with, in his letter, James, he called for us to take the prophets as an example of the love in which we ought to have. You'll see it there in the fifth chapter of James and in the 10th verse, if you want to turn there and look at it. James, he spoke about how the prophets, they move with patience to bear with others. From that thought, I, I think of Moses, who 
Yes, he, he would get very frustrated with the children of Israel because again, as the Lord said about them, they were a stiff necked people. But Moses, even in his frustrations, he was frustrated with them because he loved them dearly. You know, that's how we are when it comes to our loved ones, the ones that we love. We can we can get really frustrated with them, but we are supposed to be patient with them. We aren't supposed to give up on them if we if we truly love them. The bond of perfection, it doesn't give up on anybody. You see, Moses. He interceded on the behalf of the children of Israel after they had built the calf of gold and they had worshiped it. The Lord, he, he was ready to move on from them because they had built that calf of gold and because they had worshiped that calf of gold. God was ready to move on from them with that promise that he had promised to Abraham, that promise that he had promised to Isaac and that he had promised to Jacob. The Lord was ready to make Moses a people. But because Moses had interceded on their behalf, the Lord, he stood by them. And he delivered the children of Israel to the promised land. Look at what Moses' love did for the children of Israel. I tell you today that our love for one another, it can do the same thing. We'll see James in the fifth chapter of James and then the 13th verse. He encouraged us to love one another and see to each other's needs. First, James said that when we are in trouble, he said that we should pray for ourselves. And if we are uh, cheerful, he said that we should sing out songs and we should rejoice. See, these are things that we can do for ourselves. But again, we ain't in this world by ourselves. We, we, we haven't been left to tackle life on our own. James, he said that in the 14th and in the 15th verse, he said that if one is sick, if one is in trouble, they should be prayed for. Guess who should be praying for? James there in those verses, he called on the elders of the church to pray over the sick and to anoint their heads as a form of medical treatment so that the sick could get better. Again, I want you to understand there. James didn't say, hey, you leave those that are sick, leave them to their sickness. James was calling on us to love. James, he was calling on fellowship. He was calling on the bond of perfection. For all of us today in the bond of perfection, I want you to understand we should be doing no less. If you see someone sick, you shouldn't just leave them to their sickness. And I want you to understand today, sickness ain't just physical. It's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual as well. We should leave those who are afflicted to their afflictions by themselves. What would that make of us who have been called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Guess what we should be doing? Prayerful. We, we should be praying for each other in our sicknesses, in our trials and in our tribulations. Guess what we should be doing for each other? We should be praying for each other. And even those that are beyond our walls. That's what we should be doing. You see, prayer, again, it is so powerful. Praying for each other is so powerful. Collective prayer, I tell you today, it is so powerful. But why are we overlooking it today? Why are we undervaluing prayer today? Why do we not take collective prayer seriously today where prayer can fix things today. I don't know if you hear me here today. Collective prayer, Paul said to the Corinthians, is able to deliver us from troubles and from burdens that are beyond measure. In his letter, Paul would repeatedly thank those who would, would pray for him. We saw that in our Sunday school lesson. At the end of our lesson today, what did Paul do 
when he, when he spoke about, when he testified of what he went through in Asia. He thanked the people for praying for him because those prayers, they went to the Lord and he was uplifted over his trials, over his tribulation. Again, we should not undervalue the power of prayer. With my own eyes, I have witnessed what prayer can do, not just for me, but for all of those that are around me. Years ago at Pilgrim Rest, I witnessed what collective prayer did for a deacon of the church. I know what prayer can do for someone. I know what prayer can do when we come together and when we pray for each other. Do you recognize the power of prayer today? Again, I testified of my years of dialysis. And again, I said that I didn't go through dialysis and make it through by myself. I know what collective prayer brought me through. I know what we can do for one another today. And I'm calling on that today. I'm calling on us to uplift one another today instead of being so selfish today. The bond of perfection, it ain't selfish. It is a bond. It is togetherness. James said in the fifth chapter of James and the 16th verse, he said that the fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. It'll do something. And the something that it'll do is that it will fix. It will correct. It will uplift. I don't know if you hear me here today. Also in the bond of perfection, if we truly love each other, James, he said that we should talk to each other. There in the 16th verse again, there in the fifth chapter of James, there is much power and encouragement and just simply talking to each other. That's why I love when we can fellowship together after a service. Because talking can do so much to encourage and to uplift a soul that may be depressed, that may be in the pit of despair. You see, the idea here when we talk to one another, and as we'll see there in the 16th verse, James, he stated that we should confess our trespasses to each other. The idea is that we can help take the weight off of each other's shoulder when we simply talk to each other. Do you realize that you can help someone with the weight of their guilt and with the weight of their burdens if you're simply there to listen and then to talk to them? Instead of being someone that likes to jump down someone's throat when they come at you, when they talk to you, how about loving them, listening and, and talking to them? See, so many of us, we, we have guilt from things that we believe we have done wrong. And it weighs on us tremendously. And what, what James said there, it gets to the topic of forgiveness. And we remember what John said about Forgiveness, that if we go to the Lord and if we confess our wrongdoings to the Lord, that the Lord is both faithful and just to, to forgive us, to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Jesus, he taught us that if, if one was to wrong us, that we should rebuke them, but that we should listen to them. And if they were to repent, that we should forgive them, that we should take that weight off of their shoulders. I tell you again today that talking, confession, listening. It is incredible. It is a powerful source of strength that is again overlooked, that is undervalued today. Being able to vent to somebody, to, to just let all of that go that has been bubbling up on the inside, it is something good. And, and I remember my dad once saying this, is that he said, you can't tell anybody anything, so you have to make sure that you're venting to the right people. Who better to vent to, to talk to, than someone who you are in fellowship with? Someone who is in fellowship with the Lord as well. 
Who better? Encouraging each other with whatever it is that we are dealing with and with whatever it is that we may be going through. It is so good for your soul today. And I truly believe that just being there for somebody, it is a big help that we as believers who are in fellowship with one another, that is what we should be doing. Again, I tell you today, we are stronger together than we are apart. Apart, life will beat us up. Apart, life will knock us out. It will knock us flat on our back. It'll put us first, uh, face first down in the mud. But together, together we can overcome life. Together in the bond of perfection, we have the strength, we have the power to beat life up. Imagine that, beating up life. And I tell you, there's so much power and strength that we can give each other if we were simply to do it. Will you do that today? See, when we support each other, all of us can live peaceably. All of us can rejoice at the end of the day. All of us can live for the better. Our fellowship, the bond of perfection, as James, Paul, and even Christ said, it is able to save. The peace I spoke of us fighting for in my sermon last week, that is the peace for which we ought to be moving out of today. We ought to be moving out of that peace. We ought to be letting that peace guide us. We ought to be moving out of that love. As Paul said in my key verse here, the peace of God, it should rule in our hearts and we should be guided by it. We should speak from it. We should be acting out of it. In other words, we should be moving out of grace. We should be moving out of love. To the Ephesians, out of the burden of perfection, Paul encouraged that we should let no corrupt word proceed out of our mouths, but that we should let what is good for necessary edification we should let that come out of us so that it may impart grace. As believers, as those who are in fellowship with the Lord and with one another, we should be imparting grace to each other. Our bond, again, it is one that uplifts, it supports, it helps. And again, I tell you, that is true love. This is the true love that I wish was practiced in our world. This is the love that I wish was celebrated, not just on Tuesday, but every day of the year. In the end, we can only truly live for the better. We can only truly live at peace if we love one another with the love that is of the God and in the bond of perfection. Amen, amen. Amen.